Well, um, good uh, evening from Australia. Uh, good morning if you're in the United States of America. Um, and, um, and whatever time of day it is, we welcome you to this continued series from the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on Asia and the world. Uh, on this occasion, we are delighted to be joined by the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva. Uh, Kristalina Georgieva, the Manager, Managing Director of the Fund, comes to this conversation with uh, enormous experience. Uh, Kristalina uh, was um, most recently uh, the uh, acting CEO of the World Bank and prior to that, the Chief Operating Officer for uh, some years. And before returning to Washington, uh, Kristalina spent quite a number of years in Brussels as the uh, European uh, Commissioner for Budget and Resources. I imagine, Kristalina, that won you lots of friends and many enemies, both in Brussels and in various of the member states. Um, and prior to that was uh, the European Commissioner for International Development and began her career, if I'm, if I'm right on this, uh, as uh, a uh, career officer within the World Bank itself back in the early 1990s. Um, so uh, it's... Um, Great to have you on uh, this series, Kristalina. Uh, a few um, words before I uh, begin. Uh, the reason we're, of course, uh, gathering uh, is because of COVID-19. We know it's simultaneously a public health crisis. We know it's an economic crisis. Um, and, of course, our friends at the fund have been seeking through hard work night and day seven days a week to prevent an economic crisis from metastasizing into a financial crisis and to draw on the deep learnings of the global financial crisis of a decade or so ago. And so uh, that's why we judged it was um, really important uh, to have uh, an opportunity to speak with the managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Um, of course, uh, since the crisis unfolded, it's been a uh, frenetic activity uh, within the fund. Uh, we've seen uh, an additional uh, trillion dollar loan facility negotiated by the fund. Uh, we have seen uh, literally uh, emergency um, lines open to uh, dozens of, um, of states around the world with dozens more lines being uh, of financial support being uh, considered by the fund uh, as we speak. So I'm not sure um, Managing Director, whether you get much time to sleep these days, uh, but uh, it's wonderful to have you with us in this, uh, this link up with the Asia Society. Uh, I'm going to invite you to make some opening remarks about how the fund is responding to the crisis. Then you and I will engage in some um, conversation for the subsequent 20 to 30 minutes. And in the, during the course of that, we will receive questions from our uh, audience tuning into this webinar from around the world, which I'll put to you. And we'll close uh, hard on the hour at the end of this, um, of this session with you. So Managing Director, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. It is really an honor to be in a conversation with you. Uh, and it is uh, a, an added bonus that you are running it from Australia. Uh, I have uh, personal reasons to have a very uh, soft spot for Australia. When the Iron Curt Curtain fell down, uh, in 1990, my very first big adventure was um, in um, Australia and in Fiji. Uh, I still fondly remember teaching at the uh, Australian National University um, and feeling that finally I was a global citizen. Um, so let me, let me get to uh, the um, subject matter of today. Um, we do face a crisis like no other. Not just because of the scale and the fact that it is the worst crisis since the Great Depression. It is a crisis like no other because of the uh, specificities you mentioned. One, a combination of a health crisis and an economic uh, shock. Uh, let me add to that. Uh, it is for the first time in our history that we consciously stopped 
the economy, we stopped uh, companies from producing and consumers from going out and consuming. And that is really a very dramatic shock. Uh, we call it the great lockdown. Um, fortunately, countries in Asia are ahead of the curve to start unlocking, getting out of this uh, a great lockdown. But more importantly, it was a very sudden, abrupt change in fortunes for vast majorities, majority of countries. Uh, I still remember in uh, January in Davos talking about anemic growth of nearly 3% in, uh, in 2020. And then shortly after, we went into negative territory. We actually projected in April minus 3% growth. So from 160 countries with projections for positive per capita growth, we jumped into 170 countries with negative per capita income growth for 2020. In other words, a great reversal. And uh, as you know very well, we still have a cloud of uncertainty um, uh, because we are dealing with the novel of coronavirus. We don't yet know how exactly the world is going to be uh, wrestling with it and coming victorious on the other side. Now, this being said, we have to recognize that there are reasons to be hopeful. And let me list three that uh, I don't think are stressed strongly enough. Number one, we also have seen an incredible action on scale by governments around the world. Uh, if we need a definition for leaning forward, we have given it in this crisis. We got nearly $9 trillion of fiscal measures applied in countries so we can prevent massive bankruptcies and unemployment. And we have done that in a way that is quite remarkable, quite rapidly. Uh, central banks, and I must stress that they acted in a, in a uh, uh, synchronized manner, they provided massive liquidity stabilizing the world economy. Hmm. We, so that is the first reason we have to give credit where, the, where, the, where credit hmm. is, is, is due. The second reason to be, um, to be hopeful is that we do anticipate recovery to start in 20, maybe even late in 2020 in, in some countries. Uh, but basically in 2021, we project um, at this point, 5.8% global growth. True, this is partial recovery. We are not going to reach the pre-crisis level in 2021. But we believe that the uh, ability to step up production uh, once we see a handle on the crisis and even more when we get to a point of vaccines and treatment. This is ahead of us. Uh, and the third reason to be uh, uh, positive is uh, we are in, in uh, 2020 when science is uh, a powerful uh, weapon to deal with uh, situations like this. Uh, I, for one, have uh, very high um, trust in um, the ability to come up with more permanent solutions um, in the form of, of vaccines. And we have seen in this area a mobilization um, led by, by the European Union primarily, but with many countries around the world joining to bring some $8 billion to $9 billion capacity once vaccine is available to be available around the world. And this is very critical because we can't stop the pandemic unless we stop it everywhere. So that kind of action is, is critical. Let me say uh, two uh, things about Asia. 
since uh, mm. it is the focus of uh, your work uh, and your interest. Uh, Asia, as we know, came into this crisis uh, in a relatively better position. Many economies uh, were operating from a position of strength. And uh, it went into crisis early, has taken uh, quite uh, dramatic actions early. Nonetheless, for 2020, we expect Asia not to grow. This is a huge uh, turn of uh, uh, fortunes vis-a-vis uh, -vis the past. Uh, and um, we are seeing the, uh, uh, from the experience of Asia that uh, it is not a trivial thing uh, to bring the flares of uh, pandemic uh, down. They spark every so often, and that requires uh, very careful attention. Like everywhere, a number of countries um, uh, that are um, commodity exporters or rely on tourism are particularly uh, severely hit. So this is the first point. A Asia is impacted, like the rest of the world, coming from a better position. Uh, the rest of the world goes under in a minus territory, Asia just simply doesn't grow. Uh, the second point is that uh, remarkable actions have been taken in Asia. Uh, mm. The, uh, the uh, fiscal measures I talked about in Asia range, uh, broadly speaking, between 5 6% and over 20% uh, New Zealand holding the uh, record uh, uh, stimulus. So Asia is using the fiscal space it has for its own good, but also for the good of others. Uh, and let me finish with a couple of words on us at the fund. Um, like everywhere, this crisis meant for us dramatic change in the way we work. Let me recognize that the fund is created for situations like this. And it has been long-standing tradition that we are in our best when the world is in its worst. And I think it is being repeated uh, now. We have immediately stepped up with emergency financing. As of today, we have provided lifelines to 57 countries. This is unheard of in the history of the fund. Uh, we have doubled access to emergency financing. We have gone into massive increase of concessional financing because what we see in this crisis is the same way weaker organisms, weaker immune systems mean that people are at highest risk to the virus, weaker economies are at high risk to the economic uh, shock. So we tripled our concessional financing, and we did something quite unique. We mobilized grant financing so our poorest members are free from servicing their obligations to the fund initially for six months. We intend to extend this to two years, if necessary. And as, uh, as uh, I am sure people uh, have noticed, we have added to our toolbox a new instrument uh, called short-term liquidity line. Beyond financing, for which, by the way, thanks to the wisdom of our shareholders, we are reasonably well equipped. We have $1 trillion lending capacity. This is four times more four times more than during the uh, global financial crisis, quadrupled. Uh, beyond financing, we revamped the way we do surveillance by zeroing on the policy actions countries are taking to fight this crisis. And now we are going, we have that, we call it policy tracker for those of, uh, of our audience that are uh, a really policy honks. It is available on our website for 193 countries, and we are going to build on it also policy actions for responsible reopening so countries can quickly learn from each 
other. Uh, let me finish by saying that uh, what we are concentrating today is acting decisively um, to support countries and foreseeing what is next to come. What is next to come, of course, is reopening and then recovery. And then identifying what are the issues on the other side, both risks and opportunities. We want to look into that today so we can be useful to the membership uh, with early on defined policy advice. And I'm sure later on we can uh, come to those uh, uh, in our conversation. Uh, so let me stop here, uh, Kevin, and again, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you bring this nostalgia for Australia from uh, my early, early professional days. Well, I'm glad we were able to make you feel welcome way back then. And for our Australian audience, I should remind people that uh, Kristalina came out of uh, Bulgaria and, uh, and then um, began her um, international career uh, once the... Um, uh, we saw the collapse of the former uh, communist states of Eastern Europe. And uh, she's been a great gift to the international community since then. Christina, you talked about the growth projections um, and the fact that um, in the April World Economic Outlook, uh, you projected a growth uh, contraction in 2020 of uh, 3% and a recovery into 2021 of 58 I've noticed some of the individual country reports that you've subsequently issued contains some further revision south. Um, China, I think, down to uh, 1.2 plus uh, or positive for uh, the 2020 uh, calendar year. India, I think, down to 1.9. Uh, Japan, negative 5.2. Even our friends in the ASEANs in Southeast Asia, now uh, minus uh, 0 0.6. So I've also seen your reports in Reuters and elsewhere indicating we may be looking at a further revision of the numbers um, come June. Uh, what can you tell us further about how you see the rest of the uh, calendar year 2020, um, given, as you rightly said last time round, uh, the uh, April report was a baseline scenario assuming mm. uh, an earliest recovery in the second half of the year. Your thoughts on that, please? Right. Well, uh, uh, let me first um, recognise that um, in this very high degree of uncertainty, uh, projections are really hard uh, to make. And for the mm. first time in a long while, uh, we presented not only a baseline scenario, but also adverse scenarios mm. if there is a second wave in the fall, of pan you know, pandemic hits again in the fall, or even worse, if we are to have a second go around the world in 2021. 20, uh, Hopefully this would not be the case. However, what we are now recognizing is that the spillover impact from the uh, lockdown are possibly for some economies going to be more uh, severe. In other words, when we do our assessments on the basis of the uh, impact domestically of lockdown, not taking full account of the spillover from lockdowns elsewhere, that may lead for a, um, for a number of countries uh, to a worse um, outlook than we anticipated in April. We will see also some positive surprises. And um, uh, unfortunately, what we are um, assessing is that on balance, the downward revisions are likely to uh, be larger than the cases where conditions are better than anticipated. Uh, overall, East Asia has been uh, the place where there are still positive uh, projections. Um, you mentioned uh, a number of them. Actually, Vietnam is uh, at this point of, the, of, of time our uh, most optimistic uh, uh, growth projection for the year, 2.7%. Uh, 
and that is uh, on on the surface it looks like oh well so asia is doing well but we need to remember against what we are placing those so in the case of vietnam from 7% down to 2.7 in the case of china from 6% down to 1.2 uh, so we are we unfortunately uh, and to finish answering your your question early data that we are collecting in a number of countries um, are indicative of likely downward revisions and uh, we will uh, we will present that in uh, in june um, uh, obviously i i'm in this rare case when uh, when i make these projections there is nothing i would like better than to be wrong uh, it for life to outperform uh, our projections but for now this is where we are good thank you for that you mentioned um uh, before the um, uh, fact that you've been well resourced so far in terms of the IMF's ability to act. Uh, this uh, trillion dollar facility extended to you by the member states. Uh, I remember back in the days of global financial crisis, we thought that we were doing a, an extraordinary thing by extending to the fund 250 billion back then. Um, we've now quadrupled it in the current circumstances. So this is a good thing. It's a um, a statement, uh, almost a deep learning from the events of, uh, of a decade ago, uh, that when it comes to the IMF's capacity to operate in the world, uh, it needs to have a capacity to reflect whatever it takes uh, to ensure that states, uh, through challenges to liquidity, do not end up with challenges to solvency. Mm. Uh, of course, when it comes to banks, um, uh, within uh, major economies around the world. Of course, in the global financial crisis, there have been deep learnings as well. Um, stress testing of um, systemically important banks, uh, revised capital adequacy ratios, et cetera. But as you seek to remain ahead of the curve, which is a very difficult technical challenge in your position, uh, and looking where the next wave of challenges comes from, I looked at JP Morgan's recent projections on the level of defaults likely to occur um, at the corporate level uh, around uh, the world. Uh, what do you see as your next uh, set of, as it were, instruments available? In fact, one of our partner organisations uh, here in Australia for this particular webinar is the Australian Financial Review. Mm. It's Australia's leading financial newspaper, a bit like the Financial Times of the United Kingdom. And uh, they're particularly interested in in this question of whether you see the IMF um, in the long term perhaps acting as some sort of lender of last resort or coordinating, as it were, uh, liquidity measures provided by cent uh, national central banks around the world. I'd appreciate your reflections on looking forward to your next set of financial market stabilisation measures. The um uh, lessons from the global financial crisis in terms of stress testing banking institutions have been really well integrated and so what mm -hmm. we see today is that uh, they pay off big time mm -hmm. uh, the um, attention is um, uh, and rightly so focused on can we bring more uh, more supervision to the non-banking financial institutions where risk taking has been uh, elevated and uh, we have been discussing uh, this issue even before the uh, uh, coronavirus virus hit with the uh, financial stability board as one that deserves attention and it is getting uh, attention uh, when it comes down to uh, projections uh, on the uh, corporate side, uh, I am confident that one of the lessons that we would draw out of this uh, crisis uh, would be around um, a more cautious approach to building up debt and liabilities. Uh, we see that uh, 
a warning that has been issued by many, including by the IMF, prior to the, this crisis, that debt levels, both sovereign debt level, corporate and household, uh, have been climbing uh, into dangerous uh, territories. Uh, and uh, my predecessor, Christine Lagarde, kept saying, when the sun is shining, fix the roof for governments, uh, but also make sure that you manage your debt responsibly. Uh, human nature, Kevin, being what it is, we tend to fix the roof when it rains. Um, <laughs> Hopefully, we would see now that there would be in this crisis um, uh, really a very focused attention on early action around um, that sustainability, both in the sovereign and um, uh, on the corporate and on the uh, household side. The positive here is that uh, major central banks acting decisively and uh, governments coming up with strong fiscal measures, uh, it is helping tremendously to restructure debt obligations, to give space for debts to be uh, served in all these three categories. Uh, it is for now clearly sustaining uh, the world economy. And the question is, uh, will these measures of uh, more responsible restructuring, debt restructuring, uh, uh, be taken forward uh, uh, decisively. And uh, for the fund, where, where we come is uh, uh, one, providing uh, uh, objective analysis. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, we have the uh, uh, financial sector assessments that we do for all countries. Um, uh, right now, we are finalizing one for the United States. Uh, these are our uh, key uh, entry points in uh, giving um, an objective uh, advice uh, or, or analysis for countries. Um, I can tell you the um, fact that they matter is demonstrable in the um, uh, quite heated discussions we have uh, when we are completing this analysis. Um, as for a role for the fund in, uh, in and, and by the way, we have been also uh, very much supportive of major central banks taking their liquidity action beyond their borders. Uh, the Fed has done a wonderful thing by extending uh, swap lines, including to a number of countries in Asia, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, South Korea. We actually are hoping to see even broader um, uh, inclusion of countries, uh, of emerging market economies with good fundamentals, with strong fundamentals uh, in that regard. For the fund, we are a lender of last resort for governments. Now, when we work with governments, obviously what we want to see is financial stability and in that sense, uh, the conditionalities that come up with uh, fund programs uh, do aim to see a um, responsible approach to um, both pri public and private sector uh, finances. And uh, very often um, our attention does focus on uh, the um, uh, corporate side in terms of what we recommend uh, to countries. We do not have a role, neither we anticipate one now for uh, being a source of financing directly to corporates. But let's remember when we talk about stress tests uh, and, and I take pride, I mean, okay, it was way before my time. I still take pride of the fact that the IMF invented stress testing some 20 years ago. And uh, the IMF is uh, now thinking of, can we expand stress testing to also include some new risks to the financial system, hmm. like climate uh, risks? Hmm. That's, um, it's fascinating. Um, the uh, stress testing disciplines that you had in the fund historically, uh, these were those which uh, we then a decade ago through the Financial Stability Board then asked to be applied to systemically important banks. 
uh, in the yep. private sector around the world, given the origins of the last financial crisis. And it's interesting that you're saying that these stress testing disciplines beyond the banking sector uh, need to be applied more generally. You spoke about the non-banking sector. Some would call it the shadow banking sector. And I think we know what that means, the future role of private equity, et cetera. And now it's quantitative significance in the world. And then you raise the very important thing about given the objective economic significance of climate change in action or action and the real impact on economies over time. Um, uh, I've uh, now spent all of three months as a member of your international advisory panel, mm. uh, <laughs> the IMF. The, um, but one thing that's fascinated me in discussions with colleagues uh, who you've uh, also invited to be part of that panel is this question of, uh, the level of effective institutional collaboration that you now have and enjoy between the fund, the Financial Stability Board, which we created a decade or so ago, um, uh, albeit it was um, uh, pre-existing in a different form but with lesser powers, and also the Basel Committee, um, Give me a snapshot of how well it's actually working beneath the surface, uh, because um, a decade ago, let me tell you, we had to scramble. <laughs> um, and we hope that a decade later, that the machinery of act active collaboration, the lines of communication and the protocols and the known disciplines coming out of the last crisis have enabled you to work more seamlessly as, an, as a set of institutions given our collective desire not to allow the economic crisis to metastasize into a financial crisis. Just give me a sense of how it's all working internally. Well, the, uh, the, since you mentioned the advisory um, council I have created, uh, thank you for being uh, part of it. Uh, it is one more demonstration of how important it is in complex environments to seek collaboration and uh, multiple entry points of uh, wisdom. And this is what was done after the global financial crisis quite effectively to create not only the additional uh, body of the Financial Stability Board, but to build the interface across key institutions uh, at the IMF our role has been since then to use the spring and annual meetings of the Bretton Woods institutions as a place where all of us come uh, together and that we craft some of this space to be for very candid discussions among the um, top decision makers in countries and in these institutions. And I can say that even uh, working virtually, this coming together and making sure that we zero on the key issues and uh, how they can be uh, best addressed, uh, that has happened in, uh, in April. We do have the platforms for interaction. And I can tell you, this is incredibly important. It is not by miracle or by chance that policy actions on a large scale have been taken by all major economies and actually by, by a very large number of uh, countries in a synchronized manner. Uh, many are complaining that maybe coordination is not as stellar as it could be, but let me say uh, genuinely with respect to the synchronized action that it is a form of coordination to have major central banks uh, and major economies taking very strong, very massive actions in um, very often within days of each other. That would have not happened if we didn't have this forum. Uh, the value of people talking to each other on a regular basis during good times materializes most strongly during bad 
times. And I can, as, as, as uh, someone who has a front seat in this crisis, I can, I can say that uh, uh, there has been very rational uh, comparing of experiences, talking to each other, uh, taking uh, actions in that uh, manner. So That's well done well. In, your pre in your prior uh, engagement, uh, Kevin, when, when you were in the midst of the global financial crisis. Well, um, colleagues gave a lot of thought at that time to what the Financial Stability Board should do and how it should work with the rest of the international financial regulatory system, including the fund. And I remember when we did stress testing and capital adequacy ratios, the howls of protest from the private banking sector about this gross intrusion uh, into their lives. I think a decade later, they're somewhat uh, grateful for the fact that that's now what happened. Um, again, a question of interest to uh, the Australian Financial Review is where we now go to in terms of global trade. A huge element in um, your uh, projections uh, for global growth hinge on the recovery of global trade. Yet uh, what we now, f uh, and not just um, uh, the immediate areas of concern, which is the future of um, uh, the future of um, the uh, trade and medical supplies, uh, the, whether there's going to be uh, an open um, and uh, free availability in terms of, for example, vaccines when they're developed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, at a macro level, um, the forces of nationalism and protectionism are alive and well. Uh, looking at this crisis, many nationalist politicians around the world are saying, this is proof positive, we need to start shutting the doors, uh, greater national economic self-reliance, uh, and this, of course, becoming a pretext for new levels of tariffs, of subsidies and other forms of, of protectionism. Um, do you see that in your analysis? And what do you think institutions like the fund and the international community can do to push this back in the reverse direction, given its impact on global economic recovery? It is um, um, a tremendous shock that has hit countries unexpectedly. And on top of it is one that uh, is not simply an economic shock, but uh, very tragic for people who, who lose uh, loved ones uh, to this pandemic. And it is understandable that the issue of medical security has taken a prominent uh, place in how at the national level politicians are thinking of protecting their people. Uh, this being said, we also have to recognize that um, in a pandemic, uh, restricting the movement of um, medical supplies um, uh, is only going to make the pandemic uh, uh, meander around the world longer. The uh, WHO does allow, in a case of emergency, sorry, the WTO, my apologies, WTO does allow in mm. a case of um, emergency to restrict exports of medical equipment. But this is a rule that works if the emergency is in one country or maybe two, three countries, not when it is a global emergency, not when it is pandemic. So we have been uh, uh, calling on, despite this understandable pressure, to keep trade in medical supplies open and to concentrate on collective action around vaccines. And I can say I was very pleased with the uh, uh, success of this mobilization uh, that um, um, on May 4th, uh, delivered some, some clear uh, promises. Looking forward, um, we would see some reinforcement of domestic capacity, production capacity, and that, again, uh, I, I would see as a rational action to protect uh, people from, from very real uh, danger for life-threatening uh, uh, situations. But we have to really work hard not to allow for this to turn into 
all-out protectionism. We know that globalization, the way it was, had deficiencies, and I, I'm the first to say they need to be addressed. We do need to recognize that um, if um, trade is regulated only partially by, by a global agreement, but uh, uh, we have uh, e-commerce, which is expanding outside. We have uh, intellectual property rights not quite protected. We have transfer of technology not really quite uh, uh, settled, and domestically, uh, parts of society that are affected by globalization are not seeing uh, attention given to their uh, legitimate um, uh, concerns. Globalization is, uh, is going to be off, off, uh, off track if we don't deal with these issues, and they are way before the crisis that hits us uh, uh, today. But throughout the history of mankind, working together, having division of labor has made us all better off. If we allow protectionism to spread, we know what is going to happen. Costs are going to go up, incomes are going to go down, poverty within countries and among countries will spread more uh, than it is today. So we have that responsibility for the well-being of our fellow uh, citizens everywhere to address shortcomings not shy away from that, and at the same time, work hard to retain the engine of growth that trade has been, not actually in the last decades, uh, always in the history, uh, when it exists, it helps to continue to be this engine of, of uh, growth. So I think we have a lot uh, of work to do. Um, it is so... Uh, humanly understandable that when a pandemic that gets trans transmitted from a country to a country leads us to a natural tendency to retreat behind our uh, the walls of our homes, behind our borders, that we have to demonstrate that we know how to handle this and that we can still have a world that is uh, open and inclusive uh, and a more prosperous world for, for all. Thank you for that. The, um, I'm just turning now to uh, questions which have come in. And one of them goes to the point that you just touched on, which is uh, the human dimensions of this crisis. Uh, you've just alluded to uh, the fact that people have been suffering enormously, 4 million infections. Uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of deaths and untold suffering, which uh, at this stage is not being properly reported or comprehensively reported. Uh, on the human dimension, the question goes to this. The International Labour Organization has just put out uh, data indicating that um, 1.6 billion people in the world, uh, that is about half of the world's entire uh, workforce, uh, is going to suffer a huge hit in terms of personal income levels. Um, from the fund's perspective, um, do you have reflections on the uh, optimum um, uh, measures of um, interim policy support to help such people and for longer-term economic recovery? And I'll come to the next question, which we and we'll try and deal with these quickly, if that's okay, because I've got a half a dozen or so here. And then in the next question, I'll come to what about a green recovery? But let's go to pure unemployment yeah. first. Well, the uh, um, message that came out of the fund very early in this crisis, very unusual for the fund, was to governments to please spend. Spend as much as you can to pay your doctors and nurses, build build strong health system, but also to protect the most vulnerable people, 
and the most vulnerable segments of the economy. And that is what underpins these massive fiscal uh, measures. Uh, and this is what underpins the very massive emergency financing that the fund is providing. So there can be strong social safety nets in place that to the extent possible firms can retain their workers that we keep them afloat, there are no massive uh, uh, bankruptcies, and also that the um, uh, most vulnerable households can rely on timely support through this crisis. Now, what we need to project is what is going to be uh, waiting for us on the other side of this crisis. And we have to be really uh, honest. Uh, we have to be candid about the future. There will be more debt. There will be more deficits, higher, higher level of deficits. There is likely to be higher unemployment stemming from the fact that some sectors of the economy that are uh, job rich are severely hit, like hospitality, tourism. Hmm. And there is a very high risk of higher inequality. So when what we do today to address these risks through responsible fiscal uh, policy, in other words, continuation of these safety nets, looking at who are the winners, and they are winners. The digital economy is a big winner of this crisis, and how they can contribute so there is no massive increase in inequality and poverty. These are policy decisions that are in our hands. And what we do at the fund is to provide the rational analysis as to what is a good balance of action. And also, what are the job rich sectors that could benefit more significantly from the likely very massive fiscal stimulus, domestic, uh, one that creates uh, domestic uh, demand and, and, uh, and boosts production, that takes into account what is on the other side and uh, therefore addresses it in, uh, in an appropriate uh, manner. Which brings me to a next question about the nature of a recovery um, from, again, from one of our webinar uh, participants, which is the possibility of uh, a green recovery. You spoke before about $9 trillion worth of fiscal stimulus. Um, that's a lot. Um, in fact, uh, doing some rough maths, that must be 12 or 13% of global GDP. Um, so it's a, a bucket load of cash. Um, uh, what is the fund saying and what are your thoughts about how we engineer an employment rich but still um, mm -hmm. climate change sensitive a global economic recovery, a green jobs recovery. Your thoughts? Uh, we, at the fund, we actually published um, a fiscal monitor that is concentrated on that question. And uh, rightly so, because uh, uh, how we design these uh, fiscal measures, especially the fiscal stimulus for recovery, uh, mm -hmm. is going to have tremendous implications on whether we are smart enough to deal with one crisis and at the same time, prevent another. Uh, and when I say prevent another, I do mean the uh, climate crisis. Uh, in Australia, you have seen the uh, severity of climate-related uh, 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 disasters. Uh, so I don't need to talk to Australian audiences as to how dangerous ignoring uh, uh, these risks uh, are. Uh, and what we recommend um, are uh, very practical and implementable measures. First, we now live at the time of uh, very low oil prices. They have uh, edged up somewhat, but are likely to, re to retain that level of, in comparison to the past, uh, uh, relatively low. Um, what it means is that uh, it is a great moment to eliminate harmful subsidies, hmm. fossil fuel subsidies. And that would be good for climate, 
but it would also reduce the pressure on budgets that need to deal with this crisis. Mm. Step number one. Step number two, governments will have to think about balancing the books in the future and looking at their, uh, the composition of uh, uh, taxation. Um, we have been arguing at the fund on uh, pricing carbon. Market mechanisms work great, whether it is tax or it is trade. We have seen that um, uh, countries and jurisdictions that have put a price on carbon reduced emissions while continuing to grow, Sweden being a very obvious uh, uh, case. Can we be more aggressive as we do have to take additional fiscal measures to create an incentive for low carbon development. Step number three, when we talk about climate resilience, uh, reforestation, taking care of mangroves, uh, building insulation, these are all labor intensive and uh, very positive from a climate standpoint activities. These are sectors that could be boosted and uh, have the advantage of generating also not only climate but also uh, economic benefits. Uh, mangrove uh, restoration not only reduces the severity of uh, 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 storms but it also improves uh, fisheries and it is a great source of income and, uh, and nutrition. Uh, so that, that thinking around job rich, climate resilient, low carbon investments uh, totally makes, uh, makes sense. And last but not least, when we think about the um, um, overall um, um, direction of uh, recovery, Putting in place incentives for uh, companies that are benefiting from uh, stimulus to reduce their carbon intensity, something that actually was done after the global financial crisis. Uh, some of the automobile uh, companies did receive help in exchange of higher standards uh, for their uh, uh, products, for emissions of their products. So they are ve we, we have done the economics of climate change for the last decade. We know that we can shift from taxing people to taxing pollution. We know we can do that. Uh, we know that we can create incentives, market-based incentives, enhancing competitiveness of the economy. And now we have a unique opportunity to do it on scale because we have to act in this crisis on scale. So as well, Nike would say, uh, Kevin, as Nike would say, just do it. <laughs> well, um, I think you know enough about me, Christalina, to know that you're singing from my own personal hymn sheet here. So, uh, and I think the good thing about you being in charge of the fund, my friend, is... Uh, uh, and what I've observed from the literature that's been produced is that this is now seen as core business uh, for the IMF, um, given its obvious yeah. um, systemic financial dimensions over time. So, yeah. Um, and actually, uh, I didn't mention something that, that, um, that goes straight at the core mandate of the Fund on Financial Stability, and it is helping uh, central banks to introduce stress tests on climate related risks. So there is disclosure of these risks, be it transitional risk uh, or physical risks uh, that helps companies to be more informed and, and, and financial institutions to be more informed about medium long term risks, purely financial stability uh, risks that stem from, from climate. And we've got about um, just over five minutes left. Another question that's come in from uh, YouTube, uh, Bradley Smith, um, is about um, your comments earlier about the explosion in e-commerce, which we've seen around the world. Um, and uh, I've participated in my own small amount of it here uh, at our place in Australia, and I'm sure you have at your house in, uh, in Washington. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, 
two bar or question. The first is, do you see this change as far as um, uh, a move to e-commerce uh, as being enduring uh, rather than temporary, uh, given the pre-existing trends which existed, which were gradual? Um, this spike in e-commerce activity, are we likely to see, frankly, that sustained it up to a large extent into the future? And what are its implications? And secondly, um, what are its implications for uh, also uh, digital currencies into the future, given that a number of countries, including China, uh, are working on these, experimenting with them and launching them and testing them? So your thoughts on those two quite complex questions for the future? Well, it is uh, unquestionable, though, that um, the uh, digital economy, the knowledge economy overall, uh, these are the winners of this uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, not only e-commerce, e-learning, telecommuting. Mm. It is where we are now being pushed to go and um, uh, inevitably this inertia that, that uh, is gained by digital uh, uh, will continue after the pandemic retreats. Uh, why? Because uh, there is uh, convenience, speed, and cost advantage. Uh, and now we have, yes, and now we have uh, a very unusual thing, which is the uh, older generations are forced into the digital place by the virtue of the uh, great lockdown. Mm. Uh, grandparents talk to their grandchildren on a little screen. They learn how to operate uh, iPads and iPhones. Uh, uh, and that getting into the routine of uh, using more actively uh, the um, uh, internet and uh, digital communications uh, uh, is going to, to continue for sure. Let me just tell you, the IMF is now operating uh, virtually. We all work from home, by and large. I have no intention when the, the pandemic is over to just go back in our offices and uh, uh, go back in our routine. We are going to telecommute much more. We are going to teleconference uh, much uh, more. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we are just one example of this, uh, this trend. And of course, it also relates to uh, digital money. Uh, for uh, hygiene reasons, uh, now uh, paper money practically out of circulation. Uh, you mentioned China. China is definitely accelerating a divorce with the traditional paper money. They, they were there before, and now this has accelerated tremendously. Uh, we have, even before this crisis, uh, receiving lots of requests uh, from the membership uh, on digital currencies. Central bank digital currencies is one of the uh, top topics of uh, uh, technical assistance uh, and engagement with, with members because country C, this train has left the, uh, the uh, station. Uh, it is, uh, uh, however, not without risks. And I, I want to, to, to say to the, uh, uh, to the um, um, person who asked this question, uh, cybersecurity risks, very significant. Hmm. Risks of using digital channels for uh, terrorism financing, very significant. Uh, in other words, moving in this direction is not going to be uh, at all simple and easy, and it would require heavy concentration of policymakers and institutions like, uh, like the IMF to make sure that we capture the benefits, but we manage the risks uh, uh, responsibly. Uh, and uh, uh, as for the uh, uh, future of uh, uh, digital payments, uh, uh, one thing I'm very worried about, and uh, I'm taking it to heart in my work, to make sure that we are not gonna, going to land in a world of winners and then countries 
businesses, individuals falling behind. Today, Africa has only 50% internet connectivity. Hmm. We have a duty to push internet access, the uh, technological side, the physical investment side, as well as the soft side, uh, so we don't, we don't see the accordion of inequality mm. in the world opening up uh, more wildly as a result of this uh, advancement. Well, those comments uh, on the digital divide, domestically, globally, mm. uh, which we've debated for a decade or more, uh, now are telegraphed into the future, or telescoped, mm. I should say, into the future. Uh, Christine, I'm mindful of the time, and you've been very generous uh, with spending an hour with us with the Asia Society Policy Institute and this our series on COVID-19, its impact on Asia and the world. Um, and uh, as I let you go, uh, let me just say two things, um, maybe three. Number one, uh, thank you particularly for the fund support for our brothers and sisters in the Pacific Island countries. Um, these are vulnerable states hit by climate change, hit by extreme weather events, hit by the economic downturn because of tourism. And you have been, uh, if I might observe, um, forward leaning in your assistance. So I, I thank you for that as someone who takes the Pacific Island countries uh, to heart. Um, and secondly, uh, to thank you uh, also for uh, your work in the fund in being uh, energetically forward leaning um, uh, at a time when uh, understanding what the next wave of uh, policy uh, challenges will be particularly if we have a sustained crisis, which, as Larry Summers said to me recently, ultimately debt ends up on someone's balance sheet. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, and therefore, thinking that through to the next wave and the next wave against um, uh, scenario planning is critical. So I thank you for, let's call it the, um, the forward-looking nature of the way in which you're exercising the mandate. And my final point is, um, when it's all said and done and you can travel again, come back to Australia. Um, and we at the Asia Society in Australia would love to host you uh, at an event. I'm sure our friends at the Financial Review would like to join us in that as well. But you'd be a very welcome guest in our country. Thank you for being with us this evening, or this morning, as it is in, in Washington. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Look forward to seeing you on our advisory council uh, very soon. I'm afraid I would first see you there before you see me in Australia. <laughs> We're still going to hold you. you to come to Australia. All the best. Thank you for being here. I will, of course. Thank you. <laughs> All the best.